preserve the spirit of democracy. However, it is not, and it was, it wasn't a process that took place in one night. It was a long journey for the people of Indonesia to arrive to this democratic state, democratic nations. If I may say a few ingredients that have made our democracy as it is today. Number one, this is a very diverse nation. This, the populations in this archipelago speak 719 languages. And behind the languages, there's traditions, cultures, that also as diverse as one would think of. But the youth of these nations get together in a conference like this, 17 years before independence, and able to agree on three things. Number one, let's unite as one nation. Number two, let's unite as one country. And the most important and the most crucial for today, let's adopt one common language. And the language that was chosen was not the language of the majority. The language that was chosen was the language of the minority. And it was accepted by everyone 17 years before independence. I, I must say, not many nations in the world are able to agree on one language before independence. And we did it. Because of that, the 770 languages, the extreme diversities, can be expressed using one common way of expressions. And today when we have meetings, we need no translator. When we have parliament gathering, we need no translator. And even at times of crying, when we have frictions, conflicts, when we come to the table to reach an agreement, the negotiation takes place without interpreter. Our heart could be burning, our minds could be polarized, but when we express it, the language that allows us to feel one is available. But it currently, in the state of being imprisoned in Malaysia, in these difficult days, his leadership and his wisdom are necessary for all of us. So, I I strongly hope that he will return to this forum to speak about Islamic democracy in front of us in very near future. Now I have to touch on the recent uh, history of the democracy and Islam. The uprising has brought a definitive end to a severe condition in surrounding countries which they seek to shelter. I believe the people in the certain number of the country of the Middle East and North Africa are seeking for peace and security under the rule. It is quite certain that these people are keenly realizing the importance and the need for Islamic democracy than ever before. In our host country, Indonesia, as the minister just told us, is excellent the President Habi has actively led the process of his country's transition to democracy and has managed to establish constitutional democracy in a country which has the largest Muslim population. What is the puzzle, sir, the Malaysian until today? Why the language changes name from Bangsa Malay to Bangsa Indonesia? <laughs> this has been a constant debate with myself and my friends in Tunisia. I told them there's no such thing as Indonesian language. It's always a Malay language. <laughs> you can call it Bahasa Melayu Malaysia or Bahasa Melayu Indonesia, Bahasa Melayu Singapore or Bahasa Melayu Batani. But nonetheless, that revolutionary initiative has made a Malay language into a global language from a language of about 20 million people into a language of 300 million people, which is not the biggest Muslim language in the world. The path to ensure sustainable security, stability, 
and prosperity of the Muslim state. We have seen too many instances where security and stability enforced by dictatorship and authoritarianism are only illusion, delaying later disaster. The challenges before Muslim democracy are enormous. It has to deliver justice and prosperity, eliminate poverty, provide education, healthcare, and other tangible socio-economic goods. Yet, genuine Muslim democrats are often under intense pressure to fulfill the aspiration of their core constituency that are sometimes inconsistent with sensible priority, such as the implementation, such as the demand for the implementation of Luke's law and other symbolic aspects of the Sharia. In Europe, we have prosecution of Muslim minorities in non-Muslim states and we have serious governance problems in different Islamic world, Muslim worlds around the, uh, uh, around the world. In this critical juncture of the international system and Islamic world, there are important responsibilities that Muslim Democrats have. And the most significant issue is, I guess, to launch a conversation of these responsibilities, these duties, the possible division of labor, and create a conversation about what can we do, and launch a forum in terms of exchanging opinions, exchanging ideas, and expect, exchanging possible resolutions uh, with different Muslims around the world. This debate, of course, will not be only about the Muslims in the world. In a broader framework, it should be about possible contribution of Muslim Democrats to the global issues, global problems, including poverty, xenophobia, global warming even, and most significantly nowadays for international security. We have to have important says about this. And in addition to that, we also need to launch a conversation that contributes to the theory and practice of democratization. I so believe and feel myself rescued that I don't, need, I don't need to engage in a conversation of whether Islam and democracy are compatible anymore. Chinese magazine Foresight, in their special published report, 20 persons, 20 years, he was the only Southeast Asian leader named in the report to have a very prosperous future. So for the World Forum to be associated with him, it just means that inshallah we will have a long and prosperous future in determining the better, better outcome of all. I shall be reading the speech by Dr. Suri Anwar Ibrahim, who is the convener and co-founder of the World Forum for Muslim Democrats at our second international conference today. And it's entitled, Muslim Democrats Must Lead the Ummah in a Turbulent World. Friends, fellow Democrats, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me extend a warm welcome to all our participants and delegates to this conference, the second national conference of the World Forum for Muslim Democrats. I remain gratified by the support of Sasakawa, the Habibi Center and Center for allowing the articulation of the vision first formulated to unite Muslims in the pursuit of democratic reforms. Specifically, I must express my personal appreciation for this endeavor, not only to those who are sitting here, but also through the enthusiastic support and consideration by former presidents Sikhi Habibi, Bahabibi, Abdullah Gul, and Dr. Rashid Ganushi. More than three years ago, Ladies and gentlemen, in March 2012, I was in Dubai at a conference presenting the changing political landscape in the Muslim world when the idea of this forum took shape. When I used the phrase, changing political landscape then, it indeed reflected the turbulent times that we were in. However, now with the benefit of hindsight, it did not anticipate the pace of the change, nor its intensity and ramifications. The Arab Spring was still unfolding, with Tunisia blazing the democracy trail after successfully deposing Ben Ali just 13 months before that. A hardly a year later, Bashar Assad warned protesters of consequences of working with foreign elements to undermine his regime. Socialists and autocrats 
are incubators for fanatics. In the absence of hope for reform or peaceful regime change, their hope, their only option is to promise heaven by blowing themselves. The barbarous few terrorists came to create fear, perhaps to provoke similar retaliatory actions of hate. It is imperative to ensure they fail to do so. We must remember that they do not speak for or represent the overwhelming majority of peace-loving human beings. The barbarous few cannot be allowed to hijack Islam. Friends, ladies, gentlemen, Democrats worldwide, it is time to unite. Anwar Ibrahim, Sunil Budo. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. That means that uh, uh, what, uh, what is important is uh, not only who governs or which structure is for the Islamic governance, but uh, is the, uh, whether it is up-down uh, process, bottom-up process, or horizontal process. That we should also concentrate on this issue, and uh, I think uh, this is also important for Muslim democracy. Uh, this is how is the topic of group that uh, could be tension zero. It should not be any tension uh, if we work uh, and uh, but uh, I think that perhaps privacy, you know, like the liberty of the art of security, <coughs> which is a difficult, difficult environment, difficult to work with environment. So I don't, I don't mean that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two statements that come in uh, to be uh, concerning uh, around the world. The first is uh, the fact that uh, we, the fact now has a several concern. Uh, the statement uh, that now are very open and if I you need. Um, so uh, my colleague will let you know where to go for those. Um, but for now, I'd like to thank once again uh, Professor Kira Hanil, Zero Ita, Fahali, as well as Kilish for our outstanding uh, remarks. Uh, <laughs> Sekiranya tidak, maka naratif yang tengah narat naratif barat, cadangan barat, semuanya yang mereka tahu segala-galanya. Sedangkan seperti yang disebut oleh peserta tadi, tidak ada kaitan sekalipun dengan isu pelarian. Sedangkan sekarang pelarian ini maksud. Jadi itu agenda utama kita dan insya Allah menerusi kumpulan-kumpulan percaya langsung, kita akan mencari satu yang spesifik. which is the highest alert, uh, emergency alert that there can be in, in Belgium. 
And the reason was, of course, that one of the terrorists involved in the Paris attacks was on the run. And uh, you may have heard some newspapers talking about a uh, certain commune in Brussels called Molenbeek, uh, which is a tiny little commune in Brussels, but there's a great uh, Muslim majority population, mostly of North African descent. And it has become notorious, I have to say, as the jihadi capital of Europe. Now, I don't know whether that is true or not. Um, Molenbeek, for me, has always been a commune like another. But that is the media representation of uh, Molenbeek and also of Brussels. Uh, now, to distance themselves from attack, carried out in their religion, uh, such apologies necessary? Well, I would say, in Japan, Islamophobia is not an industry. The negative attitude of Japanese hold toward Islam are mostly driven by ignorance, lack of personal contact with the Muslims because of the scarceness or tininess, smallness of the uh, Muslim population. The Japanese may be drawn to what they see Muslim pureness the disciplined abnegation on display during Ramadan, yet, unlike some in the West, they don't appear to feel challenged by perceptions of superior spirituality. A very, very few immigration from Arab war. No heavy concentration of Muslims exists in any one city or region. From the eyes of ordinary Japanese, Though foreign or immigrant Muslims are seen more on their nationality base than on religion base. Again, I just can't say anything like anywhere else than uh, Japan. Yeah. As long as Islam in Japan remains a marginal issue, Islamophobia seems to have little place to pray. The Japanese are not hostile in particular toward Islam. The overall attitudes of Japanese have been one of indifference, but now has shown a bit more friendly tone recently.
ISIS militants, and this was on the 6th of October, were disguised as refugees, and this was following the uh, Paris bombings. So the fact, the irony, that refugees are linked to terrorists, when in fact the refugees are fleeing the very sorts of violence that terrorists are imposing upon society, uh, it, it is the height of irony. And I think it uh, highlights all the more how important it is for us to find solutions to the situation. Uh, given the, the, the title of the topic, Human Rights and Refugees, um, it was very uh, well pointed out that, uh, in fact, uh, protection of refugees uh, very much starts from a human rights perspective. Uh, it was noted that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, provides for the right to asylum. Uh, we have the 1951 Refugee Convention, and we have other conventions such as the right, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, all conventions that are international instruments that uh, refer to the right to asylum. I uh, highlighted the Bali process, which is a, a, a wider grouping of some 40, 39 to 40 states in the region and, uh, and beyond, uh, as well as uh, the Jakarta Declaration process, which was in fact started uh, in Indonesia by the former Foreign Minister Marti, and now being uh, followed up by uh, the current Foreign Minister uh, uh, Europe, where I come from, uh, Muslims have integrated into the society, into the fabric of society. What there is, is a fear of extremist version of Islam, this fear of terrorism linked to Islam. So I would uh, link to people who claim to be Muslim, if I may say so. So it's not so much Islamophobia that I worry about at the think tank where I work. It's actually how uh, Muslims are being associated with extremist versions of this religion, which is not the case for the vast majority of taxpaying, peaceful citizens of Europe. Uh, there's a bit of background that I actually uh, gave, and that is that Europe is going through multiple crises at the moment. There is, of course, the Eurozone crisis that you're all aware of. Brexit, there may be Brexit, I hope there isn't. Britain the EU will be a terrible tragedy. Um, but this debate on immigration and Muslim minorities is not a new one. I've lived in Europe for 35 years when there is a teenager. And it's the, it's, this discussion has been going on for some time. Integration takes place, but at the same time, there is resistance to it. 9-11, of course, changed the narrative. And the debate has been increasingly uh, becoming more and more toxic, more and more uh, poisonous, more and more hysterical, and I would say extremely emotional. So you have this debate on immigration, which has led to the uh, creation of the far right, uh, many far right movements, even in Germany, which did not really have much of the And of course, we know the power of Marine Le Pen. She may win in the regional election. In fact, she's certainly going to win in the upcoming regional elections. The power of Gay Wilders, Nigel Farage, and others. So this debate has been going on top of that. You've had, of course, the refugee crisis that the previous speakers have talked about. Uh, and in America, the Chancellor has been enormously, uh, I would say, um, generous. She's been enormously open about borders, and I think she has really set the tone for the rest of Europe. But Angela Merkel's policies are not being backed by many, many governments, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. So there's a divide. And uh, one of the speakers uh, said the report, uh, the World Justice Report of 15, and the World Wellbeing Report of 15. And enormous country ranks in the top 10. And it's just, that's, the, that's the sad reality of the same countries when it comes to delivering uh, social justice. We are way behind most of the countries. And, uh, uh, and this time is with uh, uh, the, one of the speakers when he said there is a discrepancy between the ideals in Islam and the reality. That's, that's very important. Um, and not just satisfy, but actually introduce the laws to implement those, uh, those governments. Um, uh, I, mean, uh, <laughs> I would recommend is a, is a film about Northern Ireland called Search for Socrates. It's a wonderful young uh, film about a young boy, and of course.
course, many of you who are older will remember the famous Brazilian football player Socrates in 1985. In terms of the, and in this movie, uh, one of the things that was interesting was about the importance of, of enjoying and seeing things positive. And I think the need for reflection, the need for reflections comes out of today's discussion. I bring back today's comments earlier this morning. The importance of lessons of history, not just the negative lessons, but the positive lessons of history. And the need to continue to look within and to reflect in a way that's constructive. Thank you very much for a wonderful day.
a Muslim democrat in such a society. Demokrasi Pancasila. Namun saya yakin sebagaimana penerian ormas Islam seperti Nahdlatul Ulama dan Muhammadiyah bahawa demokrasi Pancasila, Pancasila juga adalah berteraskan nilai-nilai Islam. Saya juga gembira berada di Jakarta pada hari ini kerana kedua negara kita, Indonesia dan Malaysia, hampir tahun ke-50 tamat konfrontasi. Dan usaha menamatkan konfrontasi ini adalah inisiatif yang datangnya dari Indonesia iaitu dengan inisiatif Pak Harto yang menamatkan persengketaan yang merugikan kedua-dua negara. Dan Alhamdulillah penamat, penamatan konfrontasi ini juga telah menjadi pemangkin kepada pembentukan Asia yang kini menjadi rakan kepada kuasa-kuasa besar. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today to articulate the vision of this endeavor or initiatives laid down by the convener and the co-founder of this forum, Anwar Ibrahim. Good governance, social justice, and cultural empowerment. Where 